first word is esoteric. When something is esoteric, it's... <laughs> All right, so the word esoteric refers to um, something that requires specialized knowledge. So in a conversation, somebody might use this word to say, sorry to be esoteric, and then they'll continue talking about some subject or some concept that requires a certain level of knowledge in the given field. Next word, superfluous. Um, superfluous just means extra, really. Is it, can a person be superfluous? So superfluous, yeah, just, just refers to stuff that's um, maybe not necessary, or the ex the extra just stuff or extra extra things uh, in a given context. So maybe you know, like, oh, I have so much superfluous stuff in my kitchen. Of course, using superfluous in such a casual way like that is very unnatural. But you could do it if you really wanted to sound smart. Acquiesce. Acquiesce um, means to um, like you might have. Oh, I, can I say a line from Pirates of the Caribbean? Something like he will not acquiesce to your request, or she will not acquiesce to your request. It just means she won't obey, or listen, or do as told. Um, but that's it's it's the same exact meaning to acquiesce, to accept something, uh, or yeah, to go along with. Angst. Angst refers to just kind of this like that that unhappy feeling, this sort of angry or maybe melancholy or just feeling like, you know, you're misunderstood. So a teenager, or I suppose a teenager themselves might not use this word, but the parents of the teenager might say, oh, my teenager is so filled with angst. Kitsch, kitsch, kitsch refers to, in my mind anyway, just um, junk, honestly. It's the little things that, you know, might crowd your house, like a snow globe or special little ornaments or just, um, you know, decorative knickknacks. You might say, oh, my aunt's uh, apartment is really kitschy. It means she has maybe like a lot of knickknacks or the style is just kind of... Thinking outside the box. This is a phrase that means just thinking differently or, you know, outside the norms of regular thinking, which would be inside the box. And then choosing to think about something in a different way might be considered outside the box. So it's usually a compliment, like, great job thinking outside the box, Stevens. The next word is the bottom line. The bottom line just refers to kind of the... Um, the end all of the situation, like uh, in a sentence, uh, the bottom line is we have to make more sales next month, uh, meaning this is the one thing that we really need to focus on. The next word is hit the ground running. It just means to start well. Um, if you think about a runner, of course, a runner, as soon as maybe they touch the ground at a race, they are running. And it's sort of the same thing here, except in a business sense. So as soon as a project starts, they're going, they're, you know, pushing forward on the project. You might say, um, next week we're going to start the new project, let's hit the ground running, meaning to get a good start. Next word is giving 110%. It just means um, giving your all or uh, making your best effort to do something. So of course, 100% is the maximum in a given situation, um, but giving 110% means um, that, you know, your boss presumably wants you to give more than your best. Uh, so it just means work really hard, as in, um, hey, we have that meeting coming up next month, let's give 110% to make sure all of the materials are finished by then. It is what it is. It is what it is is just a phrase that often wraps up a conversation. Sometimes it can be a negative situation. Like you hear, oh, sales are down this month. Well, it is what it is, meaning there's nothing we can do, or that's just the situation right now. Um, it's just a, uh, yeah, Ooh. just a filler phrase, really. My stomach's making noise. It's curriculum vitae. Is that how you say that? Curriculum vitae. 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 Curriculum vitae. Vitae? Curriculum vitae. You might see this abbreviated as CV when you're looking for jobs. Most of the people who are looking for applicants will request your CV or your curriculum vitae, which is really just a record of your life, um, your history, often your work history. You might see it uh, written on a job form, um, something like, all applicants must submit their curriculum vitae uh, to be considered for the position. Mm. But most of the time I see it as CV. In American English, though, I should point out that um, you might see resume instead, which is the same, the same exact thing that's asking for your work history. Next is ad hominem. Uh, ad hominem means to attack somebody, like when you're arguing or having a discussion, but you're not actually addressing what the other person is saying. You're just attacking that person. So you might say, um, he was arguing ad hominem, meaning, in other words, he was not uh, actually debating the issue, but he was just attacking the other person in the argument. Deus ex machina is the next word. This is a fun word, especially if you like watching movies. 
Deus Ex Machina um, literally means God from the machinery. So anytime you're watching a movie and suddenly out of nowhere somebody comes in to save the main character, for, for example, um, that's an example of Deus Ex Machina. So if you're writing, for example, if, you, if you're writing a story, uh, it's typically a good idea not to use Deus Ex Machina. Your teacher might say, don't use Deus Ex Machina in your writing because it seems kind of cheap, right? You know, your main character gets in a jam and then something amazing happens and they're saved. What's the fun in that? The next word, next phrase rather, is magnum opus. Magnum opus just refers to um, usually a masterpiece or someone's life's work, a huge work. So like uh, maybe Beethoven's magnum opus would have been his uh, fifth, Beethoven's fifth, what was that, a symphony? Yeah, uh, Beethoven's fifth symphony was his, perhaps his magnum opus. Um, hey, there's a sample sentence right there. So if you, if you have a big project that you're working on, maybe, maybe you're an architect, maybe you're a painter, whatever it is, whatever's the biggest thing in your project portfolio, maybe you could refer to as your magnum opus. It's your, uh, your great work, whatever's the biggest thing for you. The next word is alter ego. Alter ego is kind of a fun word. It means your other self. So um, you might have seen characters in movies that have an alter ego. In one situation, they behave like one character, but in another situation, they behave like someone else. They're alter ego. Maybe even some of you have an alter ego uh, and it bothers your friends when you have, you know, when you behave uh, a certain way with one group of people and a different way with another group of people. Um, that's your, your alter ego coming out. It's not always necessarily a negative thing, like uh, superheroes have alter egos. So Clark Kent, for example, Clark Kent's alter ego is Superman. Um, it's his other self. He is Clark Kent and he's Superman, um, but in different situations, he's one or the other. Zany, Z-A-N-Y, I don't need to spell it, they're gonna see it on the screen. Zany just means something that's amusing or different or a little bit weird, perhaps. So you might say, my friend is so zany. She bought a New Kids on the Block lunchbox last week. Why was that the first thing that came to mind? The next word is zillion. Zillion is just a word that we use in place of a very large number. So you probably know million, billion, trillion, for example. But when you just want to emphasize that something is a huge number or there's a lot of something, you can say a zillion. For example, there were a zillion ants in my backyard last week. The next word is zoom. The word zoom actually has two meanings. The first word is uh, on a camera, for example. You can zoom in to get closer to the subject or you can zoom out to get further away from the subject. Um, I think, are you gonna zoom now? Zoom in, zoom out. Okay. <laughs> Uh, zoom also is an onomatopoeia. An onomatopoeia means a word that sounds something like what it's supposed to be representing. Uh, this onomatopoeia means to go very fast. So you might say, I'm looking forward to getting in this new car. I hear it zooms. The next word is zest. Zest means to do something with great enthusiasm. Like you might say, I have a zest for life, meaning you're really interested in life and you have a lot of energy for it. Zest also has a second meaning, um, which is used uh, in cooking a lot. Like you might take the zest from a lemon, meaning a little, little tiny particles of something and put it in your food. So those are, there. Those are some things. The next word is zoology. Zoology refers to the study of animals. You might have it in your university. If you're a university student, there might be a zoology department. Um, so you might run into somebody one day who says, oh yes, my major's in zoology. What are you studying? Lager. Lager is a word that I know very well. Uh, lager uh, refers to a kind of beer. Um, so when you go to a beer festival like Oktoberfest, for example, you might say, this year I'm planning to drink a lot of lager or a lot of lager beer. It's a type of beer. The next word is wanderlust. This is a nice word. Uh, wanderlust just means that you have a desire to travel somewhere. You want to go somewhere. Uh, you might say, oh, I've been seeing all the photos that my friends have been posting on the internet lately. I'm, it's giving me wanderlust, meaning I really want to go travel. I really want to be out there doing those things. The next word is Zeppelin. Zeppelin, this is um, a, a big airship. Oh, there's a, isn't there like an Indiana Jones thing? Where he tests, tosses the guy out of a Zeppelin? It's just, it's, uh, what do we call it now? A, f a blimp, right? Yeah. A blimp. We say blimp a lot now, but Zeppelin, I think, was the first word that was used to describe these things because I think they, they were made out of metal. So, for example, you might know the band Led Zeppelin. That could be related to the first Zeppelin. I don't actually know. Is it? 
Um, so in a sentence, you might use this M to say something like, oh, someday I'd really like to take a ride on a Zeppelin. That sounds like fun. Next word is dachshund. Dachshund, you probably know what a dachshund is. We commonly call them wiener dogs in America because they're long. Sometimes they have long hair too, but they look like, you know, a hot dog. So dachshunds, I think, are popular breeds all around the world. You might say, my friend got a new dachshund. I can't wait to play with it. Yeah. Uh, Gesundheit is the next word. Gesundheit is used um, often when people sneeze. So uh, Americans like to say bless you after somebody sneezes, but you might also hear Gesundheit after someone sneezes. Um, it's usually just used uh, as one word. We don't really say it in a sentence very much, but when your friend sneezes or somebody you know sneezes, you can say Gesundheit. Bass, as in a type of fish, or bass, which refers to um, someone's voice. It's also a type of instrument. It kind of looks like a guitar. There's also a string bass that's usually a really tall instrument um, that you play standing up. So in a sentence, when you're fishing, you might say, oh, hey, I hope I catch a bass today. If you're an, uh, a musically inclined person, you might say, my favorite instrument is the bass. Great, those were pretty good. Uh, next is uh, wind, as in the air, uh, blowing, blowing air, and wind, as in like to wrap something around something else. Wind, uh, you might say, the wind is really strong today. Uh, I should have brought my kite to the park. Wow, okay. I don't know, every once in a while these oddly specific sentences. Uh, wind. Like, maybe you have a ball of string at your house, and it's gotten all tangled up, it's really, really messy, and uh, you find it one day and you think to yourself, oh, I really need to wind this ball of string into a clean, like, tidy ball. Like, next, uh, tear, a rip in something, um, like you might tear a piece of paper in half. The same spelling um, can also make uh, the word tear, which is, uh, that drop of water that comes out of a person's eye when they're sad, or sometimes when they're very happy. Use them both in one sentence. Whenever I tear a piece of paper, a tear comes from my eye because I feel bad for ruining trees. Or my, my friend made me tear up my favorite love letter and I shed many tears as a result. That one was slightly better. All right. Next is dove. Dove can be a bird. It's a white bird. It often represents peace. And it can also uh, be pronounced dove, which is the past tense of the verb to dive. Uh, so you might say the dove dove into... What does a dove dive into? <laughs> the dove dove into oncoming traffic. <laughs> the dove dove into the pond to take a bath. Next is close, meaning to be near, uh, and the other pronunciation is close, meaning to shut, or it can also mean to end. Um, so in a sentence, let's see if we can use them both in the same sentence, um, please close the door that is close to you, um, because the show is coming to a close. Oh, yeah! Hyperbole, hyperbole. Um, it's not hyperbole, though it does sound very funny to say that. Uh, hyperbole just means to exaggerate something um, or to make, to blow something up, make it uh, really extreme. My friend uses a lot of hyperbole when she talks about her life stories. I really don't think some of those things happen to her. Hyperbole, not hyperbole. Next, Antarctic, not. Ah, oh, I see. Antarctic is the correct pronunciation of this word. Some people say an antar Antarctic? Really? Oh, I guess when you're saying this word quickly, you might leave out that first C in the Antarctic. Uh, so don't say that. Don't do that. Say Antarctic. The, the very, very cold region. The Arctic is the north cold region on the planet Earth. The south is the Antarctic. There's sort of like almost a hiccup in the word there, Antarctic. Oh, uh, in a sentence, I'm thinking about taking a cruise to the Antarctic. What do you think I need? A penguin suit, etc. Not etc. Oh yeah, okay. I've heard I hear this ek ek thing a lot. Etc. is just used at the end of a list to uh, imply that you mean other things. 
so the list is not um, exclusive to the things that you've listed. Other things can also be included in it. So in a sample sentence, um, types of fruits are apples, oranges, peaches, etc. There are others as well. So don't say etc. That's not correct. Etc. That's good. The next word is jewelry. What? Not monets? <laughs> the next word is jewelry. Jewelry. I think I'm probably guilty of this mispronunciation. I can't say that word. Mispronunciation. Uh, where the word kind of gets a little bit smushed together uh, and we say jewelry instead. We miss that, that second E sound in there. It should be jewelry. Uh, in a sample sentence, maybe you would say, I'm shopping for some jewelry for my mother for her birthday. Jewelry. We're too lazy. Prescription. Not prescription. Okay, a prescription is something that a doctor gives you. When you're sick and you require medicine, the doctor will write you a prescription. Some people might say prescription. Wow, okay. I didn't, I didn't even notice and I was doing it while I was telling you guys not to do it. That's embarrassing. Prescription. A doctor writes you a prescription, not a prescription. Uh, when you go to the doctor's office, the doctor might say, here is your prescription. Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is an eighth grade American science school word. It's an eighth grade science word. This refers to the process that plants use to convert sunlight to oxygen. The process of photosynthesis is vitally important to the survival of humans. Right? <laughs> the next word is imperturbable. Imperturbable uh, means someone who can't really get uh, upset or excited. Like it's hard to um, change the emotions of a person. Um, so you might say, I have a friend who is imperturbable. No matter what we do or what we say, he doesn't get angry with us. Onward. The next is counterintuitive. Counterintuitive is a good word, which means it's the opposite of common sense. So we talked about the word intuitive in a previous episode of Weekly Words, where intuitive means able to sense something or able to do something correctly without knowing, having to know much about it. Counterintuitive, however, on the other hand, means not intuitive, or it seems like something that just doesn't make much sense. It's not a common sense thing. So maybe, let's see, something that um, doesn't seem to make very much sense to you. Maybe uh, on your office building, for example, you have to first push the door and then pull it in order to open it. You might say, oh, the, the way the doors work in this building is very counterintuitive. It doesn't make much sense. The next word is presumptuously. Presumptuously means failing to observe the limits of what is permitted or appropriate. Oh, this is a tough one to use in a sentence. So anytime somebody does something that's just beyond the limits of what is considered normal in your culture, you can say that they're being presumptuous or they're acting presumptuously. So if, for example, a salesman comes to your door for some reason, but they enter the house and sit down on your sofa, you might say, the salesman uh, presumptuously entered my house and sat down on my sofa. I couldn't believe it. What? Sphygmomanometer? Sphygmomanometer. An instrument for measuring blood pressure. This is a new one for me, too. Sphygmomanometer is this word. Isn't this called really long words that are actually used? I have only been familiar with this word in terms of the blood pressure cuff. When you go to the doctor and they need to check your blood pressure, they'll put this thing, this sphygmomanometer, on your arm, uh, usually, and then they'll kind of pump it up and check your blood pressure. So it's a very technical word. The doctor might say to a nurse or to another doctor, um, can you please get me the sphygmomanometer? We need to check this patient's blood pressure. Philtrum is the first word. Philtrum, the groove located just below the nose and above the middle of the lips. That has a word. Philtrum. That's this, I guess. In a sentence, maybe you would say, <laughs> How can you use this in a sentence? Let's see, I'm thinking of getting my philtrum pierced. What do you think about that idea? It's gross. I hurt my philtrum in football practice yesterday. Who says philtrum? Next is larynx. The larynx is the, the voice box where your voice comes from. Um, there's quite a definition here. The hollow muscular organ forming an air passage to the lungs and holding the vocal cords. Usually I think we just say the voice box. So uh, I think the larynx in particular is really important for singers and people who need to use their voice a lot. And I think that there are even you know, special techniques that some people use to protect their larynx as well. 
in a sentence, maybe. I have to be careful not to damage my larynx because I need to be performing regularly uh, and my voice is very important to my job, for example. All right, next is navel. <clears throat> navel is commonly referred to as your belly button. It's that, you know, for some people it's indented, for some people it kind of protrudes a little bit, um, but the navel is just your belly button. Uh, to use it in a sentence, let's see. Oh, I'm thinking about <laughs> piercing my navel. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, I, have, I have an example now. Maybe if you've had to have surgery on your, on your stomach that's near your navel, um, your navel, the shape of it might be impacted. I've, this happened to my mom, it's the only reason I thought of this. Uh, when you meet with your doctor, the doctor might say, during the surgery, um, some of the skin near your navel might be affected by what we're going to do. Next is pinky. Your pinky is the smallest finger on either one of your hands. You can use uh, pinky finger. Alternatively, um, your pinky toe, your small toe, is also referred to as your pinky. In a sentence, you might say, oh no, I broke my pinky finger. I have a piano recital in three days. That actually happened to me when I was little. <laughs> That's not a lie. That's a real story. I broke my p this pinky finger. That was a good day. Anyway, next, scapula. Scapula is your shoulder blade on the back of your body. Your scapula. Yeah, what else can I say about that? Your scapula, your shoulder blade. You have two, I think. Yes. <laughs> Maybe if you're a physical therapist or if you're someone who needs to train athletes, you might need to stretch uh, their scapula from time to time to make sure that it's healthy or in good shape. Make sure to stretch your scapula before and after every workout to make sure that you don't damage it. Anarchism. Anarchism is a belief that there should be no government, that society should just rule itself. So some groups of people might say, let anarchism reign. The next word is altruism. Altruism is the idea that everyone should just be selfless. We should always just act on behalf of other people, right? Altruism is the key to world peace. Feminism. Feminism is just advocating for women's rights, supporting women's rights, uh, equal rights for women, and really just equal rights for people in general. I support feminism, something like that. All right, next is pacifism. Pacifism is the belief that violence is never justified. We should never use violence. Pacifism is great. Pacifism leads to peaceful cultures. The next word is sensationalism. It's all about making a story, a new story, sensational. So even if the facts aren't necessarily true facts, we don't know all the information, the news media might kind of make things up. Uh, sensationalism only hurts the audience because they don't know what's truly going on. Paint the town red is kind of an old-fashioned phrase, which just means to go out and have a really good time. You might have seen it in an old movie that says, come on, we're going to go out and paint the town red tonight. Let's go. Good. To be in the red. You don't want to be in the red. To be in the red means that you owe someone money. You have debt. Our company is in the red for the last quarter. We really need to improve our sales strategy. Yeah. I don't know what this was. <laughs> we really need to improve our sales strategy. <laughs> this will help. Red idiom is a red flag. Red flag is a great phrase to know, I think. A sign that something is wrong. You might say, ooh, that person was acting really, really weird. That was kind of a red flag to me. Mean if I say these things. Five red flags for me and people. All talk, no action. Always bumming money off their friends. No ambition. No skills or no, no desire to develop skills. Another one is, ah, don't know when it's their turn to talk. I don't like that. Watch English in three minutes to learn more about developing these skills, these very important skills. Onward, the next is to catch someone red-handed. This is used when you catch someone doing something bad. Uh, the teacher caught the student red-handed. He was trying to steal the hamster from the school's petting zoo? <laughs> I don't know! The teacher caught the student red-handed trying to steal the class pet. Caught him red-handed, right in the middle, in the act of trying to do something bad. That's the key there. The next one is red carpet treatment. Red carpet treatment, maybe you've seen this at awards shows, there's always a red carpet in front of where the famous actors and actresses and producers and film people enter. Red carpet treatment means to be treated very well, to be treated like royalty, really. You might say, oh, we got the red carpet treatment at the event last week. It was great. 
To be head over heels for someone. To be head over heels for somebody means that you're really interested in them. Maybe you've just met them and you can't stop thinking about them. First love, butterflies in your stomach sort of thing. That's kind of an idiom too, I suppose. He was head over heels for the girl that he met at the party the week before. We're building a story here. We're building a story here. Oh no, our story. What's gonna happen next in our story? To be on the rocks. This phrase means um, to be having problems in your relationship. It means that you're struggling or having trouble. In a sentence, my friend told me about that girl that he met at the party last weekend, and he said they went out for a few dates. Wow, this is all happening so fast. They went out for a few dates, and now they're on the rocks. Mm. Okay. Next is to be an item. To be an item just means to be in a relationship with somebody. If you're officially uh, in a relationship with someone and your friends might say you're an item now. To continue our little story. Even though my friend said he was on the rocks with that girl he met at the party a few weeks ago, it seems that they are now an item. This is weird. This is really weird. The next one is to pop the question. To pop the question means to ask someone to marry you. Yeah. Remember that girl that he, my friend met at the party like a couple years ago? Yeah, he finally popped the question to his girlfriend. Mm. It means he asked her to marry him. The next one is uh, to tie the knot. To tie the knot means to get married. So two people come together and tie a knot. They won't be separated, in other words. So maybe, maybe this is the end of our story. I don't know. So my friend ended up uh, tying the knot with the girl that he met at the party a few years ago. Acrophobia, a fear of heights. Uh, if you don't like going up into tall buildings, for example, you can say, I have acrophobia. I don't like going into skyscrapers. You don't like to see things below you. Uh, yeah. The next word is arachnophobia. Arachnophobia means a fear of spiders. You might have seen a movie called arachnophobia that had a lot of spiders in it, as you might be able to guess. In a sentence, you could say, oh, will you please kill that spider for me? I don't want to go near it. I have arachnophobia. Okay. Next word is claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is a fear of small spaces. So uh, if for whatever reason you find yourself like uh, on a crammed train, for example, you feel really uncomfortable and you want to get off the train. That's called claustrophobia. In a sentence, you might say, Ooh, I don't want to take the rush hour subway. I have claustrophobia and the commute makes me really, really nervous. Next is agoraphobia. Agoraphobia means um, a fear of going outside. So someone who prefers to stay inside, to stay at home more often than not, might be um, agoraphobic. Uh, my cousin has agoraphobia and he refuses to leave the house no matter what we say or what we do. Mm. Keep in mind that some of these words um, are not commonly used in conversations, uh, but rather what they represent is fairly common, like fear of heights and so on. Uh, the fears might be very common, but the words themselves are not. Oh my! Ophidiophobia? Okay, ophidiophobia is a fear of snakes. I have ophidiophobia. To an extent. No, oh, I did go hiking once. I was hiking and I was actually near a Buddhist temple at the time. It was in the middle of the forest. They were doing a ritual of some kind. You could hear like, like in the forest. And then I was wa as I was walking up the hill, suddenly there's this snake. Like I saw it at the same time that it saw me and the snake was like, oh my god, a human! And I, I screamed an expletive. I was like, oh, yeah, a snake! And it like echoed through the forest. And I was like, oh my god, did the Buddhist monks just hear me? In a sentence, uh, I was on a hike and I saw a snake and I screamed because I have a phidiophobia and they terrify me. Pretentious. Pretentious is a word that means um, you're trying to impress other people or someone who tries to impress other people um, by making themselves seem more exciting or more important or cooler than they really are. In a sentence, you might say, my coworker is so pretentious, he's always exaggerating exaggerating his stories to make himself sound important. Don't be pretentious. The next word is ubiquitous. Ubiquitous just means something that you see everywhere. Smartphones, smartphones, <laughs> smartphones. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still laughing about smartphones. It's a fern that's really smart. It can tell when you need extra oxygen. <laughs> In a sentence, uh, you might say smartphones are ubiquitous. Everybody has one now, and I have one too. Albeit, uh, albeit just means although. In a sentence, she was making progress, albeit rather slowly. The next word is ambiguous. Ambiguous just means something that's, the meaning is not really very clear to you. Maybe uh, if you're reading the newspaper, for example, and a sentence is written kind of strangely, you might say, hmm, the meaning of this is rather ambiguous. All right, love, really? Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> love is just 
that intense feeling where you really, really like somebody else. Uh, it could be your family member, it could be a partner, a romantic partner, whatever. It could be a food you really like as well. Uh, just anytime you have that really deep, strong emotion, you can use the word love. For example, I love pizza. It's my favorite food. Jump the gun. Jump the gun means you do something too quickly or you don't think enough about something before you do it. In a business setting, maybe a subordinate makes a decision before the boss has had a chance to decide on something. You might say, Stevens, you've jumped the gun again. We can't forgive you for this one. You're fired. <laughs> okay, the next one is drop the ball. Drop the ball means you don't do something that you were supposed to do. Somebody was supposed to do something and they didn't do it. They dropped the ball. Like in basketball, right? If you have a ball, you're supposed to pass the ball to your teammate. If you drop the ball, you let everybody down. My coworker really dropped the ball when he forgot to send that email. We were all disappointed. Stevens. <laughs> okay, next, slam dunk. A slam dunk is something that you are sure is going to happen. Maybe you have a good relationship with a client, for example. You can say, yeah, the deal next week will be a slam dunk. You know that something good is going to happen. Next, covering all bases. This phrase means that you plan for as many things as you possibly can. You have some kind of plan in mind for any number of things that could go wrong uh, or any number of things that could happen. Uh, in a sentence, um, a boss might say to their subordinate, so what's your plan for uh, the event next week? Make sure you have all bases covered. I don't want anything to go wrong. Next is playing hardball. Playing hardball is used when you're, um, you're just really, really aggressively competing with somebody. So in a sentence, uh, maybe after a business meeting, you might say, oh, wow, our, com our competitors were really playing hardball in there. It was really tough. Live tweet. Live tweet is, uh, for those of you who have a Twitter account, when you are watching something or listening to something as it happens, a popular TV show or an awards show, and you write your comments on Twitter as it happens. That's called live tweeting something. In an example sentence, I live tweeted the Grammy Awards this year. It was a lot of fun. That's a lie. The next phrase is binge watch. Binge means to do something to excess or to do something too much. So now that um, services like Hulu or Netflix or other TV or movie viewing services, there might be different ones in your country, are available, people like to binge watch their favorite TV shows, meaning they can sit and watch all of their favorite TV show in maybe a weekend or a week or something like that if they just sit for hours and hours. I binge watched all of House of Cards this season. I loved it. That's a true story. Next. <laughs> Next, the next word is neckbeard. Oh my god, I can't believe we're teaching them this. It's not a very nice word. It typically, I'm gonna get in trouble. A neckbeard is a rude word that's used to refer to people, typically men, who do not have very good hygiene, do not have very good um, personal care habits, and as a result, their beard, which typically uh, on men's faces is maybe in the chin or the jawline, goes onto their neck in a sentence. There are a lot of neckbeards on the internet. Make sure you don't have a neckbeard. <laughs> I, I don't know. Next is fandom. Fandom refers to a, gr uh, a group of fans of, it could be a video game, it could be an athlete, it could be a singer, whatever. When you talk about any group of fans, you can refer to them as the fandom. For example, video game fandom on the internet is everywhere. It's so popular, video games are. Maybe your favorite TV show changed direction. The story has suddenly changed and everybody is really upset about this change. You might say, oh, that recent change in the story has the fandom upset. The next word is hyperconnected. Hyperconnected refers to somebody who just always has an interconnection. Someone who always has an internet connection, whether it's their smartphone or their tablet or their PC, whatever it is they might use to connect to the internet, they are always connected. They are hy hyper means super. You might say, I like to stay hyperconnected, so I always have all the news. Doodle. Doodle is a funny word because of the way it sounds. It just sounds funny when you say it. Drawing something with no plan. We call that doodling. So in a sentence, when I was a student, I loved doodling in my notebook. That is a funny word. <laughs> hodgepodge, mixture of a bunch of different stuff. You might say the dinner that I cooked last week was a real hodgepodge of the stuff that I had in my fridge. Next is shenanigans. Shenanigans. I like this word. I like this word a lot. I really like to do shenanigans. Kind of small tricks that you might play on your family or your friends that are just a little bit mischievous. Not necessarily evil, but just kind of tricky or uh, just to be a little bit funny to play a joke on someone. Maybe your parents will say, enough with your shenanigans. Go to your room or something like that. The next word is skedaddle. Skedaddle is a good word. It means to to leave quickly, to go, to go quickly. You've been uh, maybe at a coffee shop for too long and you have 
have to do something else. So you say to your friend, let's skedaddle. We need to go to our next appointment. Okay. The next word is persnickety. Persnickety means that you're too focused on the details. You really like the, the small, the minutia of whatever it is you're doing. In a sentence, you might say, my aunt is a persnickety person. She always has to have things a certain way. The lights are on, but nobody's home. This phrase means that somebody seems to look aware of whatever is going on around them, but in their head, they don't really understand. In a house where you can see in the windows of the house that the lights are on in the house, but there's no one actually inside. It's the same meaning inside someone's head. It means that they're not very smart. In a sentence, my coworker isn't very smart. Well, he's the kind of guy who makes you think the lights are on, but nobody's home. Next, oh, space cadet. I love this phrase. I use this from time to time. Again, doesn't seem to be very mm, aware or very smart or very conscious of what's going on around them. Their head has a lot of space in it, perhaps. So maybe this phrase comes from the expression to space out. I'm a bit of a space cadet sometimes. I just stop thinking about all the things that are happening around me and go somewhere else in my mind for a while. <laughs> That's true. Onward, even a stopped clock is right twice a day. So this phrase is used to explain maybe someone or something who is not traditionally good at something or someone who is broken or does not do things well is capable of you know, doing something correctly sometimes. Uh, a clock that's broken and doesn't move will at two points in the day show the correct time on a traditional clock. So a person who, for example, um, isn't good at playing sports, maybe one day they have a really, really lucky day and they play sports really, really well. You might say, even a stopped clock is right twice a day. He did a great job this afternoon. This is a fun one. Not the brightest bulb in the box. There are a lot of variations on this phrase. Not the sharpest tool in the shed. We change this one up a little bit too, like not the longest fry in the Happy Meal. <laughs> Basically, it just means that the person that you're talking about is not the smartest person that you know. It's used to insult their intelligence primarily. If you think about this expression quite literally, to be the brightest bulb in a box of light bulbs would mean, you know, to shine brightly, to be very good at what you're doing. But to not be the brightest bulb maybe means you don't do such a good job at what you're supposed to be doing. In a sentence, let's see, one of my friends, she's not the brightest bulb in the box. She makes some really strange decisions sometimes. Next, a uh, very similar phrase, a few peas short of a casserole. This is very similar. I've never heard this one, actually. This phrase is, again, to insult someone's intelligence. Uh, to, if you are making food, if you're making a casserole, you need to use peas, maybe, depending on your recipe. And if there aren't enough peas, the casserole will not be very good, maybe. Uh, so this means maybe somebody is missing the things that they need in their mind in order to do something correctly. My friend, my other friend, Stevens, that guy is a few peas short of a casserole. He should have done some things that he didn't do. Vinyl, as in the material or the record? Before CDs, before tapes, there were vinyl. Vinyl records were, uh, they're about this big or there were smaller sizes, maybe about this big, people would use to play music. Uh, and hipsters, some hipsters, um, prefer to use vinyl or to listen to vinyl, rather, on a record player. In a sentence, I prefer vinyl because vinyl sounds more authentic. <laughs> skinny jeans, I feel like these are really more mainstream at this point, but skinny jeans just refer to jeans which taper at the end. So the top is bigger and then the bottom kind of it goes like this. In a sentence, I shrunk my skinny jeans in the wash the other day. Oops, my <laughs> circulation, I can't feel my feet. Onward, Instagram, Instagram, maybe you use Instagram. This is a very popular application where people can post photos and they can filter the photos to make them look interesting or different. In a sentence, follow me on Instagram and check out my pics. Oh, my cool pics. <laughs> Next is thrift store. A thrift store is a secondhand shop, a kind of shop where you can go to find things that other people have used or have worn before, and you can usually get them for a cheap price. In a sentence, I like to go to the thrift store every weekend because there are always interesting new things to find there. All right, the next word is Polaroid. Polaroid refers to an old-style camera, box-shaped. I think you can still buy updated versions of these now. And you'd take a picture, and the picture would immediately spit out the front of the camera, in a little square and you, you could kind of shake it a little bit to make the, I, I guess, but the picture would gradually kind of fade in. You would see the picture start to appear. Uh, so Polaroids, I guess, are popular among hipsters. Maybe? <laughs> I don't know. In a sentence, I like decorating my room with Polaroid pictures. I couldn't care less. People will often say, I could care less, but that doesn't really mean the same thing as I couldn't care less, short for I could not care less. It is not possible for me to care any less about this situation. So it's just emphasizing that 
whatever's going on, it doesn't bother you. In a sentence, my coworker's project wasn't successful and I couldn't care less. <laughs> oh, jerk. All right, next is nip it in the bud. Many people say nip it in the butt. It should be nip it in the bud. Bud in this case might refer to a flower before it blossoms, that small shape before the flower actually opens up. We call that a bud. So to nip something would mean to, to take something quickly, like biting, taking motion. To nip something in the bud would mean to stop something before it becomes something else. Stopping something negative from happening. <laughs> knitting a sweater, because I was knitting a sweater earlier. There's a section of the sweater where the thread, the yarn has started to unravel and you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I need to nip this in the bud. Nip this in the bud. So you decide to fix it right away instead of letting the sweater just slowly unravel as you work on it. Next is one and the same, not one in the same. I'm probably guilty of this one actually. One and the same just refers to um, something that is maybe has two names, um, but both of those names refer to the same thing or the same person. My teacher and my father are one and the same person. Maybe, you know, if your dad is your teacher in school, you could use this expression. On tenterhooks. On tenterhooks is the next expression. This isn't a phrase that I'm familiar with. I don't use this one, but it seems that some people use the phrase on tender hooks. I'm not really sure what tender hooks are. This expression is used when people are looking forward to learning the outcome of something or kind of uh, maybe there is anticipation. They're anticipating something. Um, maybe you would use this when you're watching a movie, perhaps like I was on tender hooks to learn about the end of the story, something like that, maybe. Next, moot point, not mute point, but moot point, something that is irrelevant, something that there's just no point in talking about it. It is moot. There's no meaning. Mm -hmm. A moot point. <laughs> A moot point. That's funny. I don't know. Ah, let's ask the internets. Hey, Siri. Oh, no. Okay. You're looking for a guy to fill a position and you find a guy and he's a great programmer and he's fantastic, but it's a moot point because he's a convict. I'll be back. A lot of people like to try and do an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. This comes from the movie Terminator, where Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a robot from the future. And it's really awesome. You can use this with your friends. You can use this in, in common everyday situations where you have to leave someplace, but you want to tell people in a kind of a funny way that you plan on coming back. You can say, I'll be back. Inconceivable. Say this with a lisp. Inconceivable. If you have seen the movie The Princess Bride, inconceivable. So to conceive of something, something you can think about, um, putting that in uh, at the beginning of the word means can't con or not able to conceive of something. You can't even think about it. You can't believe it. In other words, this is one word that means I can't believe it or this is just ridiculous. So you can use this anytime you're just shocked by something. You just can't believe that something is happening. You can say inconceivable. This is a very good one, a recent one from the movie Anchorman. Will Ferrell says this. Uh, he says, I immediately regret this decision. I immediately regret this decision. It's a very long phrase, uh, but it means you've just made a choice and you very quickly immediately realize this was a bad decision. I should not have done this. You can say, I immediately regret this decision, but with kind of like a flat tone to it. Uh, it's a little bit funny. Okay, next is a very famous quote from the movie Forrest Gump. Tom Hanks was in this movie. His character famously says, Mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. The next line is, you never know what you're going to get. So this refers to picking a piece of chocolate out of a box of chocolates. Uh, maybe you've seen kind of the fancy ones that have a number of different styles of chocolate in them. When you bite into it, oftentimes you don't know what's on the inside. So the character is saying that life is like that too. You might try to do a few different things, uh, uh, but you never know what's going to happen until you actually try to do it. So this is an interesting phrase to use. Maybe if your friend is having trouble in their life in some way, you can maybe try to console them or cheer them up by saying, Mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. The next quote comes from the movie Apollo 13, a very famous space movie. The quote is, Houston, we have a problem. Houston refers to the control center, NASA's control center, and the astronaut is famously quoted as saying, we have a problem. Anytime you run across a problem uh, at work or with your friends, with your family, whatever, you can say, Houston, we have a problem, meaning you're just trying to alert the other people around you that something is wrong. You need help with something, perhaps. New York style pizza. Wow. In my image anyway, um, even after reading this, is that New York pizza is just really, really big. They're huge slices and people like to fold them in New York. Um, there's lots of marinara sauce. They're topped with a whole lot of cheese and the crust is usually not super thick. So in a sentence, you might say to your friends, let's get some New York style 
style pizza for dinner tonight. I'm already hungry. California style pizza. I wasn't aware there's a California style pizza. Thai inspired? Really? California style pizza. This is new to me actually. Apparently California style pizza is any pizza that doesn't use traditional pizza ingredients. Traditional pizza ingredients would be mar marinara sauce, pepperoni, cheese, maybe black olives. The stuff that you find in pizza shops maybe all over the world, I imagine. But California pizza maybe uses, I don't know, chicken, variety of different vegetables, maybe fruits, different cuisines like Thai inspired pizzas and so on. Have you checked out that new California style pizza restaurant? It sounds good. It does sound good. And the next one I know, Chicago style deep dish pizza. Deep dish, as the name might suggest, the Chicago style pizza is much thicker than regular pizza. It could be a lot of sauce, it could be a lot of cheese, a lot of whatever topping it is that you choose, but it's just a really thick, thick pizza. So in a sentence, Chicago style deep dish pizza is excellent with beer. Uh -huh. Hawaiian pizza. Hawaiian pizza is, this just refers to the type of toppings. Hawaiian pizza is Canadian bacon, or just ham, and uh, pineapple. This was my brother's favorite style pizza growing up, and I've always hated it. Uh, so in a sentence, uh, my brother's favorite pizza was Hawaiian pizza. Maybe it still is. Quad city style pizza. What is that? A thin crusted dough with a... Ooh, that sounds good. Quad city style pizza has a thin crusty dough. Then in the sauce, there are red chili flakes and ground cayenne. So it's probably a little spicier than your average pizza. And then the pizza is cut into strips, not squares, not triangles, but long strips. In a sentence, I really want to try quad city style pizza. Beat the pants off someone. To beat someone severely or to win against someone easily in a race or a game. If you do much better than somebody else in some form of competition, you can use the phrase beat the pants off. In a sentence, let's see. My brother beat the pants off the competition at the swimming meet last weekend. My brother beat the pants off the competition at the basketball game last week. My brother is really skilled sportsman, I seem. <laughs> James, what's up? Next phrase is burst at the seams. To burst at the seams, if you imagine a shirt or just something, when there's too much inside it, the seams of it kind of go, ah, they're expanding too much. And when there's just way too much of something inside a piece of cloth, maybe the seam rips. So this phrase means um, something that is too full or too crowded. In a sentence, my subway car was bursting at the seams. I could barely breathe. The next one is by the seat of one's pants. I don't understand the history of this phrase, but it means you're able to do something because, because you're just really lucky. Like for example, I passed the test by the seat of my pants. Like just out of pure luck, I was able to do it. Next is to have something up one's sleeve. Imagine a magician or something. When they do tricks, they you know, pull flowers out of their jacket pocket or something like that, or out of their sleeve. It means you have some kind of plan ready. You're, you're prepared with something that might be a little bit mischievous. So let's see, in a sentence, I knew my friend had something up his sleeve for my birthday because he was being really mysterious. Okay. Next, wear more than one hat. This is a good phrase. This phrase means you have more than one responsibility. Maybe you have more than one job or you have a few different roles in your life. The image is that you change hats for each of your roles. I wear more than one hat in my current position. I'm in charge of a few different departments at my company. NASA. NASA stands for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. They are the uh, organization that's in charge of all space-related uh, research and space-related developments in the USA. In a sentence, I wanted to work for NASA when I was growing up. That's a lie. The next acronym is MSRP, the Manufacturer's Suggested Retail Price. You might see this on products at the store. The MSRP is the, their important point is, what the maker of that product thinks it's worth. So a store might have a sale and they say, come to our sale, everything is 20% off the MSRP. Next is the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. You might be able to guess what this is about. Civil liberties, civil rights, uh, they work to ensure that you know, people have civil rights within America. In a sentence, the ACLU is doing important work for people all around the nation. Uh, the next is the AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons. Um, there's sort of a joke, I think, that goes around that once you reach a certain age in America, magically, uh, AARP mail will start coming to your mailbox. As you can probably guess, an association for people who are of retirement age. I myself am not of retirement age, so I don't know exactly what they do, and I have never looked into it, but um, perhaps it's relevant. Uh, for some people. It seems that the AARP is the most powerful group in terms of its members in the United States. I'm guessing because they're retired and they have experience and money. I got my first piece of mail from the AARP last week. 
That's a lie. Okay, the next one is NDA. NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. I don't have a non-disclosure agreement for anything, probably. <laughs> Anyway, an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. You might have to sign a non-disclosure agreement if you're working on a project that requires confidentiality. Maybe it's government related, maybe it's a specific project, a movie, for example, that you can't talk about. Uh, the employer might ask you to sign an NDA, meaning you're not going to talk about anything related to your project. In a sentence, I was working on a project for a TV station and I had to sign an NDA before I began. Back to back is the first one. Back to back means one right after another. Back to back. In a sentence, I have two meetings back to back today. I'm so busy. The next idiom is can't stomach. Nice, nice job, stomach. <laughs> <laughs> can't stomach means that you don't like something. It used to refer to food or just something that's gross, something that's really gross. I can't stomach the thought of eating that old pie. <laughs> I can't stomach the thought of working with that guy another day. He's terrible. Stevens! Next phrase is eyes are bigger than one stomach. When you're, you know, at the supermarket or when you're at a restaurant and you see a picture of food or you see, you see a food item in front of you and you think to yourself, that looks really good. I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna buy that. And then it comes to you and you realize you can't eat it all. This is the phrase that we use. My eyes were bigger than my stomach. I saw it and it looked delicious, but I can't put all of that food in my stomach. I ordered a bloomin' onion one time and I couldn't eat it all. My eyes were bigger than my stomach. Next is a pain in the neck. Pain in the neck. There are a few other variations on other body parts that you might be able to use with this. A pain in the something else. Pain in the neck just is something that's troublesome or something that you don't want to have to worry about. Just something that just bothers you. It's just, uh, it's trouble. In a sentence, let's see. I have so many reports that I need to catch up on this week. It's a real pain in the neck. That's a true story, actually. I have to write a bunch of reports today. To pull one's own weight is the next one. To pull your weight means to do the job that you're assigned to do. You have something that you're, you need to be responsible for, so you need to make sure you do it. In a sentence, Stevens didn't pull his weight at the meeting last week. I'm afraid we're gonna have to let him go. Pull your weight, Stevens, you're bringing us down. <laughs> the next is the end, and we'll see you again next time for more fun stuff, bye.